Towards the end of the 16th century, Jodar Pasha led the armies of Sultan Ahmed al-Mansur of the Saudi dynasty and invaded the Songhai Empire. But who was Jodar Pasha, and how did he, a Spanish renegade, find himself in such a position of power, leading the Sultan's armies? Hours later, the Visigothic army was decimated and the Islamic conquest of Hispania was underway. Assalamu alaikum guys. So the trip to Al-Andalus is confirmed from June 10th to June 15th. We're walking on the footsteps of Tarif al Ziyad. We're visiting the Al-Qasar of Seville where Yusuf Tashfin met Al-Mu'atamid ibn Abad. We're even going to visit the ruins of the palace of Medina al Saharat, the palace built by Abdul Rahman III. Now there's only three spots left and if you bring a friend, you get 10% off. Jodar Pasha, born Diego de Guevara, in Cuevas del Almanzora, had been captured by Muslim slave traders as a young boy. At a young age, he joined the service of Moroccan Sultan Ahmad al-Mansur of the Saudi dynasty. His shrewdness and skills were quickly noticed by the Sultan, who later appointed him at the head of an invasion force aimed at the Songhai Empire. Now, a bit of context. The Saudi state had just emerged the victor of their war against the Portuguese, defeating them decisively in Wadi al-Makhazim and murdering their king, Don Sebastian. The empire of Portugal ran into a succession crisis, as Don Sebastian had no heir, while the Spanish took advantage of the situation and annexed their territory. On the other hand, the Saudi state, under Ahmad al-Mansur's prestige, grew stronger from the battle, and the Sultan was now looking to expand his empire. With the Ottoman Empire to the east, and the Spanish to the north, the only possible way forward was south. Al-Mansur started to lay claims on the salt mines of Taghaza that were under Songhai territory by sending a letter to Askia Ishaq II. He reckoned that tax was rightfully due to the Saudis, as his state was the only barrier between them and the unbelieving Christians. The Emir Askia did not comply with his demand to hand over the taxes on the mine. On the contrary, he sent a reply accompanied by a spear and two iron shoes, which represented a threat of war. On receiving the letter, the Sultan started drafting out an army, consisting of 3,000 musketeers with 6,000 support personnel. At their head, he placed Jodar Pasha. The Saudian expedition reached the river Niger and set up camp on its banks. Jodar organized a grand feast to celebrate their safe arrival after a long and arduous trip through the desert. They then moved towards Gao, where the Songhai force awaited them at the head of 12,500 cavalry and 30,000 infantry. The battle took place on the 13th of March, 1591, and Jodar's technologically superior troops broke the army of the emir. The armies of the sultan were a modernized force, using gunpowder and musket weapons, whereas the Songhai still held onto their spears and bows. At the moment of their defeat, the enemy threw their shields on the ground and sat on them cross-legged. They bent one knee and slashed their legs from their calves to their thighs to prevent themselves from routing and retreating. From where they were sitting, they poured arrows on the enemy until Jodar's troops overcame and killed them in cold blood where they were. The emir Askia and his remaining troops retreated and he sent word to the people of Gao and Timbuktu to leave the cities and flee. Jodar Pasha pushed on with the army to Gao, where they were welcomed by the imam of the mosque, Mahmud Darami, and the scholars of the village, and were honored with a magnificent banquet. He and Jodar Pasha conversed at length. In the meantime, Askia Ishaq sent a peace offering with very favorable terms. He would give away 1,000 slaves, large quantities of gold which he would personally hand over to the sultan, on the condition that they would draw to Marrakesh. Jodar wrote to the sultan with this proposition. They then went off to Timbuktu and encamped south of the city, awaiting the response. The letter reached the sultan, who flew into a rage, who dismissed Jodar on the spot and dispatched Pasha Mahmud ibn Zarkun at the head of 80 musketeers. Mahmud reached Timbuktu and immediately deposed Jodar, 
while the army transferred its loyalty to him. He then resolved to move and pursue Askia's hack. Askia learnt of this in Borno, so he went to meet him and they clashed at Bamba, 190 kilometers east of Timbuktu, on the left of the bank of the river Niger, which resulted in yet another victory for the Saudi army. Mahmud Pasha drove Ishaq II into exile, with the latter dying in the company of the neighboring tribes. Mahmud then laid a fatal trap for Ishaq's appointed successor, Muhammad Gao, and endeavored to wipe out the last pockets of Songhai resistance in Dendi. The Moroccan army, with a lot of difficulties, conquered Jenne in 1592 and established several fortifications along the Niger. Jenne, Gao, and Timbuktu were sacked, pillaged, and burnt to the ground. The remnants of the Songhai, led by the new Askianu, were finally defeated at the hands of Mansur ibn Abdul Rahman. The following year saw the Moroccans appointing an Askia of their choosing. Al-Mansur's army limited itself to the occupation of certain river ports where they installed forts and garrisons. The new administration of the Songhai would be hence known as the Pashalik of Timbuktu, a semi-independent province of the Saudi Empire that responded to the Sultan in Marrakesh. Following the death of Sultan Ahmad al-Mansur from the plague in August 1603, the conflict in West Africa persisted under his successors and their military leaders. However, starting in 1612, the governance of the Sudan region shifted as local appointments of pashas were made by the Arma. Ali ibn Abdullah at telemsani commander of the Arma, seized authority by overthrowing a Moroccan governor and declaring himself the new Pasha of Timbuktu, acting without approval from the Moroccan Sultan. Despite this unilateral action, the Arma continued to appoint their leaders, while officially acknowledging Moroccan sovereignty. Even as Morocco gradually retreated from the region following Al-Mansur's demise, the Pashas of Timbuktu remained steadfast in their allegiance to the final rulers of the Saudi dynasty. Every Friday sermon reiterated the authority of the rulers in Marrakesh, who communicated their ascension to power to the Pashas in Timbuktu, and the leaders of the garrisons in Gao and Jenne. The Arma's governance of Timbuktu endured until 1737, marked by continued conflicts and internal discord, as well as the succession of Pashas. Between 1591 and 1833, Timbuktu witnessed the appointment of 167 Pashas, yet only a handful managed to maintain their authority for more than a year. Now this is just one of the events that makes the Saudi state super interesting. The Saudi, among others, also ended the Portugal Empire at the Battle of Wadi al-Makhazin. Check out our full video on them.